Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second Express webinar for this AGM season, this time focusing on AGL's AGM. Uh, I'm Harriet Cater, the Climate Lead for the Australian Climate Program here at ACCR. I'm joining you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country here in the ACT. I pay my respects to elders past and present and also acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that you're all joining from today, for those of you who are in Australia. Uh, our agenda today, I'm, in, I'm joined by my two wonderful colleagues, Dimitri Lafleur, our chief scientist, who will be talking through ACCR's analysis of AGL's Climate Transition Action Plan, and welcoming back to the AGM webinar circuit, our executive director, Bryn O'Brien, who will be talking to our analysis um, and views on the director candidates that will be voted on at the AGM this year. Because we only have half an hour, there may not be a huge amount of time for Q&A, but we will address questions um, with any time we have remaining. Uh, just a reminder to people that this webinar will be recorded as well. Uh, before Dimitri kicks off with the CTAP analysis, I thought I'd provide just a little bit of context on ACCR's history with AGL. Many of you are probably already familiar with this. Uh, we actually filed our first resolution with AGL back in 2015, asking the company to set a business model that's aligned with two degrees warming. Obviously that preceded the IPCC's um, special report on 1.5 degrees, Otherwise, 1.5 would have naturally been the focus of that proposal. We continued to engage with the company for many years after that, um, specifically focusing on its management of transition risks, coal closure, and the immense value destruction that shareholders have experienced in recent years. People are probably aware that in September 2021, our shareholder resolution, which asked the company to set Paris-aligned pathway and targets, for its business or businesses, should the demerger have proceeded, record, received a record 53% support from shareholders. So that was, yeah, a record for the ASX. And today we find ourselves in the position that AGL has finally accepted that it needs to confront Australia's largest decarbonisation project. So this is a positive step. But the questions that really need to be asked are, is its plan sufficient? And Dimitri will talk to that um, shortly. And does it have the leadership to refine and execute that plan? And Bryn will talk to that straight after Dimitri. Um, on that note, I will throw to Dimitri Lafleur. Yeah, thanks, Harriet. And good morning, everyone. I'd like to start off with the main findings of our analysis. And that is that um, the climate plan is not aligned with well below two degrees and therefore cannot be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, the, the plan lacks um, uh, real detail on the technology uptake and, and specifics on um, the renewable energy uh, build out, the 12 gigawatts that they have been uh, pledged. Um, and this plan has been developed during a major phase of, of upheaval um, yeah, uh, because of the leadership flux, They're an incomplete board and an outgoing CEO. It does not have a scope three strategy that's in the works, but it's not in the plan. Um, and that's an issue because the majority of scope three emissions are related to the NEM decarbonization. And there's also no metrics with regards to remuneration that is linked to um, uh, the, the incentive to deliver this, uh, this plan. Um, AGL has come a long way. Uh, and we, we acknowledge that, but we believe there is um, uh, yeah, there's more ambition uh, possible uh, and this plan falls short of that. And um, uh, AGL needs to first resolve the, the company leadership issues uh, to really drive that ambition. So I, um, the rest of this part, I'd like to spend on the carbon budget, the global, uh, the remaining global carbon budget and what well below two degrees really means and why it is not the same as um, below two degrees. And so I'd like to start off with the, the carbon budget and because the Australian budget had been handed down yesterday. I'm going to use the suitcase as an analogy. Uh, here you see um, in light blue the emissions that are associated with a 1.5 degree pathway, which um, accumulates to around 500 gigatons that are left for a 1.5 degree uh, budget. 
And I'm focusing on a 1.5 degree budget because you'll see eventually that that's exactly what we uh, should be focusing on in, with regards to the Paris Agreement. So our suitcase, our briefcase is um, almost empty. The historical emissions have consumed the vast majority of that. And the national determined contributions that have been pledged by nations uh, to, um, uh, for the Paris Agreement, uh, those pledges consume around 444 gigatons of the 500 that are left between 2030 and 20, uh, 20, 20 and 2030. And that means that there is a very small sliver left after 2030 to decarbonize the entire planet. That obviously is not going to be sufficient and therefore we need to see more ambitions from uh, countries, from states and from uh, companies. And we'll, we have seen in the last, well, say one year that um, there is a lot of traction, a lot of acceleration of ambition going forward. Um, and that's a really good sign, but we need, to, uh, we need to see much more of that. Of the global budget, Australia has a small portion. Um, there are ways to slice that up, uh, but a, a, an approach that has been used quite often is a contraction and convergence approach, which means that um, nations are contracting, their emissions are reducing, and they're all converging to a similar uh, data point in a, a point in time. And so this approach, uh, Australia is handed down a 0.97% of the budget, but it really favors the nations that are locked in uh, uh, with a fossil fuel industry and, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, are, are built on fossil fuels historically. If you would look at a population perspective, then Australia's budget is actually quite much smaller. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it, it needs to be said that there's, uh, um, carbon budgets from people is not, um, is not, they're not equal. So we're left with a 3.5 gigaton budget and the NEMS portion of that is around 450. And that is uh, an analysis done by CSIRO and ClimateWorks that have looked at a whole of economy uh, analysis and um, uh, taking into account a 1.5 degree uh, budget and came to the um, uh, result conclusion that the NEM carbon budget is 450 million tons. It also means that Australia needs to see a net zero at 2045 because it's an advanced economy. It needs to do the heavy lifting early uh, and that um, um, makes it possible for the world to become net zero and, and see greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, come to net zero in the second half of the century because the poor countries, the less developed countries uh, we'll see the net zero target um, reach later. For the NEM, that means that uh, it needs to be decarbonized by 2031 or not much later and well before 2035. And this is analysis done by, as I said, uh, CSIRO and ClimateWorks, but also by Climate Analytics and also the coal closures uh, analysis uh, from the IEA. So NEM needs to be decarbonized well before 2035. So the next section is around what well below two degrees really means. And I uh, have to recall the article two of the Paris Agreement that calls for holding the increase in global temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. So you have to read it in combination. It is holding well below, but you also have to pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5. And here is a fictitious scenario, um, but it is a scenario that is represented as a scenario that is sees a peak warming at 1.8 degrees. This is how it is presented, but in fact, it is the best estimate of this scenario that the peak warming is around 1.8, because it comes with uncertainty around that, and it's possible that it is higher or lower. And in this case, um, the scenario sees um, that it could reach two degrees with a probability of 33%. So in other words, there is a 67% chance of staying below two degrees. And in IPCC speak, that is uh, same, the same as likely staying below two degrees or two in three chance of staying below two degrees. But it also means that there's one in three chance that you're going above it because the whole range of this scenario, the whole uncertainty range is actually quite much larger. So 
in this case, the 5 to 95% range show that it's possible that it uh, breaches 2 degrees. And this is really important because likely staying below 2 degrees is not the same as holding, you know, uh, holding uh, temperatures well below 2 degrees. Because that's what the Paris Agreement calls for. And um, you're not holding temperatures well below 2 degrees, nor are you pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. If you look at uh, 1.5 degree scenarios with no or low overshoot, that means that the temperature increases above 1.5 and then it drops down. Um, those scenarios have a 90% chance, so not a 67% chance, but a 90% chance, so very likely, probability of staying below two degrees. So you hold temperatures below two degrees and you limit warming to around 1.6, which is well below two degrees. It also limits the temperature to 1.5 in 2100. And it sees greenhouse gas emissions reach net zero in the second half of the century. So those are all criteria that are required by the Paris Agreement. So this means that you, we have to uh, uh, spend much more um, time and effort on looking at these remaining carbon budgets for a 1.5 degree scenario, because they are uh, synonymous with staying well below two degrees. And so IEMO uses consistently the terms below two degrees in their analysis. And it uses carbon budgets that are um, uh, in line with um, the, the, the uh, below two degree scenario. And um, that leads to the closures that you see here in, the, in this table, the, or the cold closures um, in, uh, in the NIM. It also has a 1.5 degree scenario, um, which has a consistent 1.5 degree remaining carbon budget. AGL uses the same assumptions as the IEMO step change scenario, but it defines it as a well below two degree scenario, which I hope I showed you is not the same. You are not using the, the, um, the representative remaining carbon budgets. And this has major implications for, uh, for AGL. As you see here, um, these are the coal assets that um, AGL has and where and when they are closing in the, AG, in the IEMO uh, um, scenarios, in the step change scenario and the 1.5 degree scenario on the right. Um, and AGL, um, the AGL's closure dates are much later than um, either of these scenarios. That is a, a problem because of the terminology used uh, in the AGL CTAP of well below two degrees. Um, but it's also, it needs to be said that there are risks involved in, um, in um, uh, getting to these scenarios because of the transmission that is required to build in time to be able to close these coal plants in the first place, but also to be able to um, uh, develop renewable energy um, at locations that currently has no uh, transmissions, but are really favorable for, um, for generating those uh, renewable uh, energies. It also has to be said that current policies are not delivering the step change scenario yet, but we've seen a lot of movement, which is not included in this scenario analysis because it's, it, it predates it. Uh, we've seen a lot of change in Queensland, in Victoria, and at federal level. So that, um, that, that's really good signs, um, but we're not there yet. So the conclusion here is that ACCR will vote against um, this uh, CTAP. It is not consistent with the Paris Agreement. And uh, our view is that AGL should model a well below two degree scenario, not by using the um, carbon budgets that IEM or step change scenario is using, but by working with a smaller carbon budget, such as the 1.5 degree scenario budget that IEMO is using or something very similar. Um, and when that work has been done, the shareholders should be provided a vote on an updated plan in 23. And we are quite confident that um, with a qualified CEO and a refreshed board, AGL can deliver a plan, like, a plan like this in the next 12 months that has much more ambition. And that plan needs to be put to a vote in the 2023 AGM. And I'll hand over to Bryn. Thank you so much, um, Dimitri. It's, um, you know, such a, a delight. It's terrifying, but a, a wonderful to um, 
put science in in the middle of these conversations, which, as you'll know, is a, a new new development um, at ACCR. And certainly, I learn something every time I, I hear you uh, talk about the companies that we cover, Dimitri. Hello, everyone. I'm joining you from um, the south coast of New South Wales on the lands of the uh, Darawal, Ewan and Geringer people. And I pay my respects to to elders past and present and acknowledge the continuing connection to country. Um, I am going to talk about our director voting intentions. And this is an unusual situation. Uh, we haven't uh, been presented um, for as long as I've been at ACCR with the opportunity for board renewal like the one that we have at AGL at the moment. Um, and that's very exciting um, for us um, and, and we think for shareholders who have suffered really um, over the last few years from uh, poor decision making. Uh, where Dimitri ended on the recommendation um, to, or the, the intention that we have to vote against the CTAP, but the recommendation that AGL put a, an updated and refreshed um, CTAP that is a uh, well below two degrees or 1.5 aligned two degree plan to a vote of shareholders is really a good segue into the conversations we've been having uh, with directors. We think that's a very sensible idea and we've heard that frankly across the market in our conversations over the last couple of weeks. We put the idea of a 2023 vote on a refreshed uh, CTAP to the chair um, uh, directly and it was flatly rejected. Um, this speaks, I guess, to uh, an unwelcome kind of continuity that we see um, in the current chair where there is um, an unwillingness to move beyond a legacy approach, a defensiveness about that approach, um, uh, rather than putting distance between the current board and new thinking um, and, and the previous approach, which, have, which has, of course, been responsible for immense value destruction, owing primarily to its uh, sluggishness around the energy transition. So we think that this approach really does need to make way for a more constructive stakeholder dialogue, and I'll come to our uh, voting intentions in a moment, but um, the, um, the most uh, serious of, of those is to vote against the chair because we do not think that Patricia McKenzie has demonstrated an appetite to move beyond that previous approach. Um, I also uh, want to make a note about ACCR's independence. Uh, we disclose in all of our materials about ACCR and you may be aware um, in, about ACCR's position on AGL that we do have one of our office bearers, uh, which is the equivalent of our board, um, who is a portfolio manager at Rock Ventures, which is associated with the Gallup -E partnership, which is put forward for independent candidates for election. I just want to address that to say the conflict has been disclosed, that um, Amina Rosenberg, who does sit on our committee, has had no involvement out in our decision making on these matters um, or indeed our analysis, um, and that we uh, do not have and never have uh, had any financial relationship with Brock or um, uh, any Mike Cannon Brooks associated, associated entity. So these are our intentions. Um, so ACCR will be voting against uh, uh, Patricia McKenzie, based upon her record as a non-executive director and committee member. So she's been on the nominations, risk and audit and accounts committees since 2019. And we think performance of those committees uh, and her leadership role on those committees does matter. And I think in any other situation um, where there, there was a real, um, uh, if we were presented with numerous candidates for chair, then we would be having that conversation. But the fact of the matter is that shareholders do not get a vote on the chair. Um, shareholders, uh, the, the chair rather is a, is a matter for the board as constituted after the AGM. ACCR thinks that in general, Ms McKenzie is a competent and capable director, but that she lacks the vision um, and certainly the approach to stakeholder relations uh, that is needed going forward and that she should be uh, judged on her record. So she has been on committees that have been uh, responsible for the poorly planned and uh, costly failed demerger, um, uh, uh, the complete mismanagement of the energy transition, which has of course destroyed serious shareholder value over the last few years, um, a, a poor approach to shareholder engagement, which at the last AGM at the end of last year resulted in 53% of votes cast voting with uh, ACCR's resolution to bring forward cold closure, again, against the wishes of, of the board and the committees upon which Ms McKenzie sat. 
And um, certainly it's worth noting that the, uh, the process that saw Ms McKenzie's elevation to chair was, uh, was unusual to say the least. Um, she was the head of the nominations committee, uh, which was charged with the responsibility of identifying a new chair and a new CEO and, and putting forward uh, new directors um, for, for a vote at this year's AGM. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the failure of, of that committee led to uh, Ms McKenzie's elevation to chair. We certainly think there are concerns there that still have not been addressed. Um, we do, however, intend to vote for all of the other directors that have been, uh, that are up for election, um, and I'll address our approach on the next slide. So we are not persuaded by the board's uh, view um, that, that has been forward that there, that, uh, there should be a hard cap of um, eight uh, directors. Um, we, we think uh, that the optimal number for this moment in time, um, when there is so much work to do, a fact that has been emphasised by the chair and by the other directors in our direct conversations with them, that, that the optimal size is 10, which is the maximum size permitted under the company constitution. So if all of the directors up for um, election um, at this year's AGM are elected and um, uh, uh, Mark Bloom uh, will continue on the, on the board and there is a new uh, CEO appointed who of course will take up position on the board, then we do get to 10. So we think that's an optimal number. We think it's absolutely regrettable that the board has not put forward any other candidates for a, for a shareholder vote at this AGM. Um, and, and we think that, that, that the candidates have been, that have been put forward uh, can add uh, serious value to the company. The board has emphasised ASX experience. Of course, the existing directors on the board um, uh, have ASX experience and um, a couple of the uh, shareholder nominated directors do as well but we don't think that that's essential in every single director that it is important but overemphasis on ASX um, experience can squeeze out diversity of thought and experience and we do think that that is something that the company has suffered from quite badly over the last couple of years. I want to address the point of independence there's certainly been a lot of speculation in the media about independence um, and independence has a particular meaning as you'll all be aware when it comes to uh, directors on boards. Um, we, in, we've done um, our due diligence. We've spoken with uh, all of the, uh, the candidates up for election, with the exception of Miles George. We think all of the shareholder proposed candidates in our best due diligence are independent. And more to the point, there are serious legal barriers um, in, in the way of them acting in a non-independent way. The Corporations Act is a very serious tool that we have to um, to um, uh, seek disclosures of relevant matters um, and relationships, and none have been made. In fact, all of the directors have stated their independence, and certainly ACCR, in our best uh, efforts, believes that they are. Um, as I said, we've met with all of the candidates aside from Miles George. In our view, um, the continuity needs of the business will be met by the election of Graham Cockroft and Vanessa Sullivan, Sullivan and the continued tenure of Mark Bloom. Uh, Miles George, of course, hasn't been there for very long, uh, but, but certainly has a, 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 couple, a, a month and a half of um, a, a feet under the desk. Um, the uh, additional candidates that have been proposed uh, by Gallopy Partnership, Mark Twidell, Christine Holman, Kerry Schott and John Polares, we, we believe add further capability to refine and execute the amended C, CTAP and deliver enhanced governance. This really is a, 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 huge, um, a huge challenge for, for the company. It's a, it is a company turnaround transformation project. We think there's an, uh, an awful amount of work to do, but we're quite excited about um, the, uh, the, the prospects for the company and shareholders if the right board um, can be put in place to lead the company with the commitment and vision to decarbonisation, which of course has been so uh, very um, challenging for previous leadership. Um, and, and we think that, that this uh, team, the team that is up for election at this AGM, with the exception of Ms McKenzie, of course, who we think um, uh, could, could very well be a valuable uh, direct director on the board, but we think she is not the right person to deliver in the role of chair. Finally, uh, the idea of overcommitment. Certainly, uh, some of the candidates that have been proposed uh, by Gallup Partnership 
do have many other commitments. We've addressed that all with them directly. They've all indicated an openness to, if elected, reducing their commitments. Um, and I'll, I'll hand back to Harriet. Thank you. Now we can see faces. Um, yeah, really valuable overview and insights from both of you. So thank you so much. We have four minutes um, left in our express session. Um, I thought I might be a bit cheeky and throw out a bit of a sort of devil's advocate question to you both. Um, it could be something that is sort of simmering in the back of um, certain investors' minds. Um, being AGL has come really far it's just in recent months. You know, this, this CTAP has, you know, finally brought forward the closure of Loyang from, from the 2040s to the mid-2030s. Will you, ACCR, will we ever be happy? Let me jump in really quickly on that. It's, um, you know, we're focused on uh, protecting shareholder value. Um, we don't think that um, the current CTAP as proposed for the, for the reasons that uh, Dimitri has outlined um, does that uh, as well as it could. Um, this isn't about perfection um, for us, but it does seem that um, the, the board in, in its current, um, under the current leadership and in its defensive mentality is not taking the opportunity to really get this right. So I think um, that's what we're looking to see over the next 12 months, to see a leadership team put in place that will take the time um, and, and the effort um, and roll up their sleeves and, and, and put in place a transition plan that can see them over the next three, five, ten years transform into a company that really uh, generates um, returns because AGL does that have that potential. Dimitri, anything to add there? I, I think you covered it really well. Um, it, yeah, I have no, uh, no uh, nothing to add there. Dimitri, so you, you're saying that this is not a Paris-aligned plan. Do you have views on, therefore, what the closure dates should be of the Bayswater and Luoyang A power stations to, to become Paris aligned? Yeah, I think that's that's up to AGL. Uh, we are not here to prescribe that. We haven't done the modelling. Um, we are just um, uh, showing that it's it's not aligned and that it's taking the yeah uh, it's 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 using assumptions that are not compatible with a, a 1.5 degree aligned or Paris degree aligned Paris agreement aligned um, scenario. So yeah, AGL has to has to, has to do the work there, um, and um, that needs to be a based on the premise of a 1.5 degree uh, budget. And um, there is a lot of assumptions that uh, go into it, and we are very, very aware of that. But um, it, it's we only want to show that this is not in line. The cold closure dates are too late to be Paris aligned, and uh, it's up to HL to uh, to do the modeling to um, to show otherwise. Thank you, Dimitri. I think it's just a really important um, uh, insight to to provide there. Uh, we are at time. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And again, feedback always welcome on this slightly more condensed format. Um, we're always conscious it's a busy time of year, so hopefully these bite-sized insights are, are work for you, but always let us know um, otherwise. Um, thanks very much. Thanks all for joining, and big thanks to Bryn and Dimitri as well. Goodbye. <laughs>